Welcome to Sales Velocity TV, where we pull back the curtain on how the top businesses in the world sell more with less resistance. Bringing over 50 plus years of combined sales experience and over 100 million in revenue generated, please welcome the hosts of Sales Velocity TV and two incredibly entertaining gentlemen, Andrew Cass and Aaron Parkinson. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Sales Velocity TV and Radio. I'm Andrew Cass. That's Aaron Parkinson. We were just having a fun moment a minute ago. And as we were talking, I said, why don't we just talk live? What are, why are we talking about all this stuff that we do? The crazy stuff that we do to get ourselves ready to perform every single day. It ties into sales and it ties into the topic. We were talking about working out and exercise today. So we could continue that talk or we could talk about how to build a winning sales team. What do you think? We, we, we should really just have our own uh, exercise and sports nutrition show. Let's just scrap this whole thing. Well, scrap listen, this whole it, sales it, velocity I, thing. you know, it's funny you say that I'm, I'm, I'm half kiddingly agreeing, but half serious because it's such a passion of mine. And I've studied it for so many decades and I played sports my whole life. And then I was, I don't even know if you know this, Aaron, but my first business ever as an entrepreneur was when I was an 18 and 19 year old kid. I forget which. And I had my own personal training business. I got certified at 18. I did an online certification when I was still I forget where, I think it was in college. I was like a sophomore or junior in college. And I was in the off season, like when I was not playing football or when I was home from school, you know, on the breaks, summer breaks and winter breaks, I would take on clients and I went down to two local gyms. And, you know, this is how early I've been selling. I'm, I'm 18 or 19 now. And I'm pitching gyms on, can I become the, the certified fitness trainer for your gym and I'll be available to your members and I'll cut you back 15%. And two gyms said, yes, I'm 18 now at this point. So I have three or four clients at one gym and I have four or five clients at another gym. I'm 19 years old. It's the summer before my senior year in college. And I'm making, you know, at that time, this is 1994 or something. I'm doing like six, $700 a week cash, which today maybe is like two grand a week cash as a 19 yeah, year old and kid. A kid. And so I'm a kid. Rich. And at that point I had gotten injured. So I wasn't training to play football. So I had all this time. So I was, I was a full-time certified fitness trainer. But, you know, to cut those deals with the gym, I look back and I'm like, man, that was kind of a savvy move as a, as a, as a young guy to not just go train people rogue, but sort of joint venture with the gyms and get Absolutely. in there and, and get in there and do, um, you know, add, add value to the gym because they didn't have any trainers offer. weren't that big then, Aaron. There weren't that many of us. Offer. You, you, you walked in and said, you don't have to pay me anything. But if right. people want to buy some stuff, I'll give you money. Irresistible offer. And the, the interesting thing is like you see today, I live in Miami. It's like there's a trainer on every corner, right? And there's trainers everywhere. They're roaming around the streets like with signs on their chest almost, right? There's so many <laughs> fitness trainers. But back we'll, then- We'll the, train for food. Yeah, we'll train. Right. right. What's that funny Herbalife thing? At, lose weight, ask me how, the bumper sticker. Yeah, I remember ads. that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, anyways, back the then it was like, man, I was like the only guy in town. I was early to the game and it was, uh, it was just- You would have been an amazing- personal trainer because you're so diligent and you're, you, there's like no gray area with you. You just, you'd be doing it right or you'd be doing it wrong. And all of your clients would have been specimens within a year. And I don't know if you know about this about me is in, in one of my business forays, I partnered in a CrossFit gym that I know. And then I went and got certified as a CrossFit instructor. I remember. And so I was essentially a personal trainer teaching CrossFit. So we both have that in common, which is really, really interesting. Now, what we were talking about before the show is you're in love with the X3 band and you were telling me this morning how you were doing like 400 pound deadlifts with this band and, and acting like a savage. And I was telling you that over the last three weeks to try and keep myself like more engaged and higher energy throughout the day, I've been experimenting with doing 12 push push-ups, 12 sit-ups and 12 curls on my X3 bar every 30 minutes from nine o'clock in the morning till 5 p.m. Every 30 Which minutes you stop and do it? I stop, I set my alarm, you know, right now we're on an hour show, so I'm gonna have to catch up with two rounds, wow. you know, at the top of the hour. Okay. And it doesn't sound like much until you actually start doing the math, because that's 18 rounds, or 16 rounds times 12 reps, is about 200 reps per day. So I'm doing 200 push-ups, 200 curls, 200 sit-ups every single day of the week. My wow. energy's through the roof. My focus is super dialed because my alarm's going to go off in 20 minutes, Dang. and I got I don't want to I don't want to get disrupted. So I'm like way more focused on the the project at hand. And I was saying to you that today, after three weeks, I can now do 70 push-ups in a session without breaking. That's 70 push-ups straight, clean with chest to the floor is really impressive. 
I mean, yeah, 50 I, mean, I, I wouldn't have 70. thought that it would have had that impact, but yeah. I guess you're, you're tacking 200 reps a day for three weeks. Body adjusts, right? You, you know who used to train like that? Remember Herschel Walker, Heisman Trophy winner, Dallas 100%. Cowboys, Raiders. You know, I played you know who the other guy was in baseball? It was This is where I got the idea from. In baseball, it was Dave Winfield. Do you remember Dave yes, Winfield? Yes, I do. Yankees guy, uh, Twins guy. Yeah, huge player. And he was Hall jacked. Of yeah, and he was big. jacked, and they said to him, what do you do for a workout every day? And he said, oh, I don't really do anything in the gym. I don't do anything. I do 1,000 push-ups and 1,000 squats per day. Mm-hmm. That was all he did, and he was he's, enormous. He's playing the reps and the volume game, yeah, and in the blood flow too. I mean, we talk a lot about performance on the show. I mean, think about the blood flow for you to stop and start, stop and start. That's, that's great blood flow. Like when we're sitting all day long, blood flow starts to just kind of slow down, and when blood flow slows down, that's how you get tired. There isn't enough blood flow in your brain, so you get tired, right? That's exactly why But if you jump up and even do 10 or 20 jumping jacks, you're doing push-ups. I mean, the blood just starts flowing again, which is... Well, this is all about performance. Like, I think, you know, sometimes people probably get on here and like, what the hell are these guys talking about? Talking about It all leads somewhere. We're going somewhere with this. We're we're going to get there. I was feeling sluggish because we're so busy. There's so many people that are, are demanding our attention constantly. Help... Help us build this funnel. Help us, you know, train our sales team. Help yeah. us build this media campaign. Help us do this. That you can get sucked into these ten to twelve hour days on Zoom, which is meeting after meeting after meeting oh, after meeting. Yeah. And and when you're in demand, you know, you got to make hay while the sun's shining. So I've had a lot of really long days, and I was like, man, I'm just like, I'm not feeling good. I'm not feeling optimal. Everything for me is about optimizing performance, right? Great. So I was like, what if I just test moving every thirty minutes on the dot? for the entire day and and the impact has been tremendous for my mm. focus and my performance and the after effects of that have been that my body has just gone boom, you know and all of a sudden I look like a, like so I'm ready for the beach. You're basically kind of ripped is what you're saying. I'm I'm I'm, I'm basically I'm basically pretty Just bad. don't ever come on the show with your shirt off and we we'll, we'll I, I will if you want me to. I got no shame <laughs> in my game. Nobody needs that. Everybody has to eat today, okay? Nobody There's needs people that. who need to see it. Don't lie to yourself. But hey, listen, we're talking about peak performance today as it pertains to your sales team and there are certain measures that you want to put in place to get this is, you know, this all ties in. I mean, these I've never seen a really good salesperson, Aaron, in all my years being in sales, training sales teams, overseeing sales floors. I've never really seen somebody go the distance and do it well that doesn't take good care of themselves. It's the, it's the first thing. I mean, they, they, they know that if they take good care of themselves mentally and physically, they're going to be able to go the distance and you're going to need to be able to go the distance in sales because sales is a numbers game and it's a high volume game, right? If you're doing it if you're doing it well, it's you're going to have to go through numbers in a lot of cases. Well, it, it's high volume, and the thing is, is that the best salespeople have longevity, and and they're consistent. And in order to have longevity and consistency, you have to take care of a lot of different things, or else the grind will beat you down. Right. Right. So that's why we a lot of the times we talk about the physical side and the mental side versus just the tactics side. Yeah. Because you can't have one without the other, and and have it be sustainable. Mm-hmm. That's the key. Right. Exactly. It, if you've never done and, and I assume everybody who watches or listens to the show has done sales. But if you haven't done sales, you maybe you just only had sales team. It is a grind. It is a mental grind. And so you, we're going to talk about some of those things today, how to eliminate some of that mental grind. But the, the focus of the show today is really about if you have a sales team or I guess if you want to build a sales team, you're at that point now where you want to. There are, there are key elements that have to be in place. So one of the things that you and I hear all the time from clients is that they're worried that their sales team is underperforming, but then they don't really know what, how to diagnose it. Like, and then they don't know what to put in play to improve it. I've, I've had to fly out as, as, as you're well aware, I've had to fly out to clients offices in different States because I can see their conversion numbers and I know it's just being mismanaged because there's no way the conversion number should be that low. And then I go in and I do an audit and I go, oh, this is a cluster bomb in here <laughs> and needs to be completely reworked. Right. But we broke it down today into the five things you must have to make sure salespeople consistently hit it out of the park. Love it. Right. And we're going to start with a topic that you could probably talk an entire hour on you know, being that you're the the CEO of our, our software pipeline pro. And this is like your, this is your bread and butter, right? Is visibility, right? First thing I ask 
people who have sales teams is what are your metrics? What's going on on your Zoom calls? What's going on in your follow-up? What's going on in the process? How many people do you have in your pipeline? What's the average order value or close rate of, of people going through each step? And they're like, I don't know. I'm like, wow, you, you don't know, which, which is extremely irresponsible, first off. It is. Secondly, you're guaranteeing that you're losing money because the things that you don't put focus on are always gonna be problematic. And, and here's the other thing that's really important these days. If you don't have visibility on what your salespeople are doing, what are they saying to your clients? What type of exposure do you have? Because maybe they're making false promises or claims or God, who knows what? Because you're not you're not paying attention. Exactly. You have no idea. Right. So ter- key point number one is visibility. And I'm going to break that into just five pieces and then I'm going to let you talk, Andrew. What's what are they saying on the calls? Can you hear the calls, listen to the calls, review the calls? And in most cases, by the way, there are not even calls. There are Zoom sessions today so you can hear and see. Exactly. Important. Right? Are they, are they sending out follow-up SMS? And if so, how often? And if so, what are they saying? Right? Are email follow-ups going out? Again, if so, what are they saying? How often are they going out? Are they taking notes? So that when they do follow up, they can quickly jump back in and start off the conversation where they ended off, right? And obviously, what are the conversion metrics as people move through the different steps in the back of the pipeline? So for me, I got to have visibility into the baseline numbers, the steps, the notes, the email, the SMS, and the calls. Because without it, you're- You don't have, you don't have anything. Without it, you have nothing. Right. You, you know what you have? I'll tell you what you have. You have a report at the end of the day from a sales guy from afar. That's okay, yeah. but that's and pretty, that va- that's pretty vague. Conversation. Man. That conversation goes like this. Did you make any sales today? No, I didn't make any sales today. Why didn't you make any sales today? Uh, I think the leads were bad. <laughs> that's literally how that conversation goes without complete visibility into your numbers and your processes for every single person that you put in that sales position. Well, listen, it's one of the reasons that we started Pipeline Pro as a sales and marketing software CRM years ago is because we've been in these environments for so long and we've been sales guys prior to that for so long that we needed the visibility for bringing big deals to clients. We needed to be able to say to clients, remember, we used our platform. You remember, I don't have to tell you. Yeah. We used our platform very successfully with high-end clients prior to saying, you know what? This should be marketed worldwide. This is a exactly. huge solution to a huge problem, which clearly it is. We're now in 20 countries. Yeah, it, have... was, it was an initial solution to our problem because right. our problem is we want to be able to see the stages of somebody progressing through the sales process. We want to be able to see the conversion numbers. We want to be able to measure how much money potential sales is in the pipeline. We wanted to be able to communicate inbound and outbound to our clients all in one software with the click of a button. We wanted to be able to call them with a click and have it recorded automatically. We want to be able to SMS them. We want to be able to email them. We wanted their, their, their appointments to be on our calendar. We wanted everything in one place so that we could sell more with less resistance. And, and we used the tool for a year and then we were like, man, we got to sell this to other people. Yeah. I mean, because- this is, it's time for us to be in the software business. This is such a big solution. And, and you just nailed it. Think about going to a client or going to your partners or going to your shareholders when they say, how are sales? How are we doing? Do we have any reporting? And you go, absolutely. And here it is. Here's where people are on the stages. Here is the recordings of all the calls. Here's all the communication that has left this contact record, email, text, voice. And here are the notes from the sales guys all in one place. And, the, and I've never had a client or a, a sales team or anybody on a project using Pipeline Pro in that example and go, okay, well, we're missing a lot of information here. They're usually like just what? They're speechless. They go, you mean you can see all that in these three channels or in these four stages? Yeah, that's the whole point. Of having, you can't scale a sales team. I always say you can't scale what you can't see. You can't scale a sales team if you can't see what the sales team is up to and if they can't be held accountable. Do you remember the story, Aaron? We were working with a, a large client university years back and 
they had a bunch of sales guys and they were all inside the system, but yet one of the sales guys didn't know how good the tracking was. And they were saying they were making like 15, 18, 20 calls a day. When they ran the numbers, they were making like two calls a day. They were fired immediately because yep. the company had the visibility to hold the sales team accountable. The sales team should know that they're being held accountable because everybody's going to perform better when they know they're being held accountable. Just how we're wired as humans. This person, I guess, wasn't paying attention, didn't realize it, and they were gone. But what if the company didn't know? And what if the company let that linger on and snowball for months on end and got very little performance out of that person when there could have been somebody else in their place that they were getting performance of? That thing starts to snowball and it just causes more and more neglect and it causes more and more money to go out the back door for the company. And sadly, a lot of CEOs and business owners don't even see it happening. Well, and that's and, the and visibility like a, a piece. Different, you know, I remember that very clearly, and that was very funny. But on the flip side of that is something that I also found super funny. We had we had a client in our high end coaching group a um, couple of weeks ago. Super nice guy, and he, I think he owned a big insurance. Uh, no, it was accounting firm. It's a big accounting firm. And we had this seven week coaching program going through all the different steps of of how to increase your sales. And he basically showed up on day one and said. Um, we put Pipeline Pro in, we had a show rate problem, we were booking appointments and only 40% of people were showing up. And now 80% of people are showing up because they're getting the automated follow-ups and the calendar reminders and the SMSs and the emails and whatever. And it was the middle of accounting season and they basically said, um, we're good now. <laughs> we'll I got, be showing up. I got all, all my money's program. worth on day one. Money well spent, thank you very much, we're out, right? That just one, I do remember. the one piece, the guy was like, you just doubled our revenue. I'm good. My, my money was well spent. Like, like paid, I'm, I'm the, gonna initial, go back to work paid the initial admission, got his value on day one, and like we never saw him again. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? That's because we're instantly affecting the bottom line. Yes, instantly. When you've got everything set up properly to see, to trigger, to follow, to listen, to review, when everything is, is set up properly, it, it, it's like a revelation it really for is. most. Yeah. Sales teams, I mean, how many clients have we talked to who are like, okay, so how are you keeping track of your your leads, your prospects, your sales, Google Sheets? I'm like, oh, that's that's just an absolute nightmare my, right there. <laughs> my response to that, as I say this kiddingly, and it comes across maybe as a little bit arrogant, but I'm like, listen, I say this a lot. You cannot scale a spreadsheet. You just have to grow out of the spreadsheet at some point. Because we, again, you know, we really want to talk about, we talk about sales on the show, but when you get sales right, you can have these scaling and next level conversations. If you don't get sales right and if you can't get systems right, you just keep running up against one brick wall after another and you never get to have the, the fun scaling conversations, right? You just, you just don't get to well, have yeah, that. And, and I live you know, more in the media side than yep. you do, right? And, and I have models from day one, from the very first click to the last touch of a sale. I've got the metrics all the way through the model of what they have to be. And if we're starting with, I don't know, the clients are like, oh, let's just spend more money on traffic. No, the answer is no. The answer is absolutely hell no. We're not scaling traffic because I don't know what your conversion metrics are on the back end. And if we don't know what the conversion metrics are, we, we don't know if it's good, if it's bad, if it's average. We don't know if it's meeting the model. We don't know if we're going to bankrupt the company by spending more on traffic. Like you have to have that piece absolutely dialed in if you have any hope of scaling to the upper levels. And it's always the same. The ones that do continue to grow year over year, the ones that don't have that data just continue to struggle and bounce around. They continue yep. to try to find themselves in business. So this number one point right here, visibility, getting it's the foundation, right? This is the foundation of the house. You can't build a nice house without a firm, concrete, solid foundation that has been molded and dried and is ready to be built upon. This is everything. Let's go to number two. Cool. Next big thing is goals and targets, All right? This is important for two reasons. Sales people, good ones, are a different animal of human being. <laughs> they like the win. They like the competition. They like being uh, applauded, right? They're- Recognition. They're just a, yeah, they like recognition, right? So in order for them to get those things that they need to perform at the highest level, you have to have goals and targets set for them so that they can strive towards them so that they can earn that thing that they want 
which is recognition, right? So if you come in and you say, uh, how many sales are you going to make this week? And they're like, uh, five and you go, sounds good. It's very, very wishy washy. But if you know your numbers going back to point one, then you'll have baselines based on the amount of leads that come in. We should convert X amount. We should do this. We should that. And you can go into them and say, Mr. Salesperson, you're going to get a hundred appointments this week. And the average that we expect at a minimum is a 10% close rate. But if you could do 15, oh, oh, you would be a superstar lady or sir. Right. And now they're like, they're fired up to chase that goal. Right. Right. So if you know your numbers, then the next thing is on a weekly basis to clearly lay out goals and targets. And it's not just about sales. There was a client that you and I worked with, um, a couple of, I say a couple of years ago now where they based everything on talk time. That was the metric that they had that they knew drove all of their business. So they recorded talk time, which you could do in pipeline, right? Cause you could just, you could see how long they were on a zoom or whatever. And, and their goal every day for their reps was you must have a minimum of four hours of talk time. And that's all they recorded because they knew if the talk time happened, everything else would fall into play, right? So maybe your target is four hours of talk time a day and your goal is to make 15 sales this week, right? Now you've got an immediate target and you've got a goal that should align with it at the end. And then everybody's on the same page because here's the thing. If you don't have targets and goals, the salesperson doesn't know if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And you don't know if the salesperson's doing what they're supposed to be doing. And you're both second guessing each other from opposite sides of the equation. And that creates fear and that creates animosity and, and nobody wins in that environment, right? There has to be very clear targets and goals laid out. Yeah. And what it also does is it, is it, is it evaporates enthusiasm. Because mm -hmm. when there's nothing to shoot for, there's no benchmarks, no goals, no competitions, no awards, no recognition set up along the way, enthusiasm just kind of fizzles out like a, like a balloon running out of air. You come yep. out of the gate strong, you love what you're selling, you're new, you're making some money, but to keep the momentum going and to stay in the game long term, there's going to, the business owner, you the business owner, you're going to need to set up maybe quarterly benchmarks, monthly benchmarks weekly benchmarks. Just funny this morning on CNBC, as I was leaving, I, I watched that Wall Street is notorious for this, by the way, the yearly bonuses. That's like the thing they work for, right? They're all shooting for the same thing. They're all shooting for the year end bonus. Bonuses on Wall Street were up 10% this year. Average bonus, 184K, highest ever. That's what those guys are working for day and night, tw 10, 12 hour days. The year end That's bonus. Their the year-end bonus is worth, you know, more than what 90% of the, the American population makes. I mean, that's the year-end bonus yeah. on top of the, the salary throughout the year. That's what those guys are. People are going to be more driven to achieving something over and above what they're making weekly or monthly. Year, there's no question. Competitions, bonuses, whatever. There, there's no question. The, the, the third point that we'll go into now is some type of accountability and feedback loop to keep emotion high. Because we talked about this earlier that it, it, is an, it can be a grind just selling day after day after day after day. So the salespeople need some type of inspiration to get into the right set, the right state. And then they need some type of feedback loop to get back into that state or get questions answered or celebrate or get recognized or whatever, right? So one of the things that's always worked really well for us is some type of morning kickoff call. Before they touch anything, you talk about the goals, you talk about the success of people the day before, you talk about what their life's gonna look like when they achieve these goals, you future pace everything for them, you get them fired up, you get them pumped up to go into quote unquote battle, right? So that, so that they're in the right state, they're not coming in and they're grabbing a coffee and they're checking their email and they're maybe making a couple of calls and they're easing the, uh, you know, and by the time noon hits, yeah. Nothing's happened. Exactly. Very right? common, by the way. Very, very common. Right. And, and, and that morning kickoff call can have a tremendous impact on getting productivity at the time, to be honest with you, when most people are in the state of buying, right. They're in there nine to nine to noon. 
action's happening, you know, to kind of 12 to noon, things kind of tend to fall off, right? So you really want to attack that first part of the day. Yep. And, and then the, the midday check-ins, call it around lunch, one o'clock, whatever. How are you doing? How many, how many leads have you spoken to today? How many, how many closes do you think you have on the fence? What, what objections are you coming up against that we don't already have handled? You know, getting that quick, like one, two back and forth resets and recalibrates to go and attack the second half of the day. When I was 22 years old as a stockbroker in New York, we had mandatory 8 a.m. sales meetings every morning. So help you God if you weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> it was like it was like guys were – if you came in five minutes late, I mean this was the culture pre-internet. If you came in five minutes late, I've seen guys get sent home. Piker. For the week. Even Piker, don't come back till next Monday. I mean, it's, it's gotten, I've seen some ugly environments where like, you know, they instill, this is a younger environment, more of a, of an aggressive environment, not, not, not an environment that's really productive today, but it was in the nineties. It isn't today because of technology and all the things we talk about here. It doesn't have to be that way. But like you said, you nailed it. The check-ins and the ongoing training and kind of, you know, you know, getting the blood flowing, so to speak with your pitch and, the way you present to kick off the day versus just rolling in whenever, hopping on the phone whenever, starting Zoom sessions whenever. That regimen, we're all wired by regimen. That's why kids have routines. Kids thrive with routines and they grow into adults. They'll grow into productive adults if they grew up with routines and they'll usually maintain their routines. We yep. need, especially in sales. In sales, you need routines more than anything else. And, and, I, and I think that's a great point is, is routines, regimens, and checking in on progress. Because again, recognition is one thing. Progress is another. We're all wired to want more recognition, but we're addicted in most cases to progress, more so even than the money, right? I know I am personally. I know you are as well. Like I really, I, I love the journey. I like building things. I like seeing the progress. Even sometimes if the money isn't where you want it to be, the progress continues to motivate you. So when they see that they're making progress, they might not be making sales, but if they're making progress, they stay in the game. And a lot of yep. times in sales, there's going to be down period. Sales is a big up and down. Peaks, valleys, peaks, valleys, right? And the guy that can stay in the middle and stay upbeat, positive, and, and can be focused on progress is going to do better long term because you can get really discouraged if you have a week without sales, let's say. That's a, that, yeah. that's a tough place to go on into the weekend and then have to come back on Monday. It's almost like the, 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 you know, the batter in baseball who's in a slump. Then he starts getting in his own head. And then he starts thinking, is it over for me? Am I done? Have I had my day? Up. And then it's like, oh boy, yeah, it can get ugly. Absolutely. So Absolutely. the check-ins are and, key. And, and just pro propping people back up and having that feedback, feedback loop with the morning and midday check-ins, just it almost like allows them to, you know, shed yesterday or shed the morning, refocus, rezone in and, and start from scratch. Because that restart. And a lot, you know? listen, a lot of business owners don't love hearing this because this is going to require, if you want a good sales team or even a good salesperson, you're going to need to micromanage that process as the business owner. And if you don't feel like you have the appetite to do it, you're going to have to find someone that does. Because yeah, if manager. this is not managed and if these things aren't happening, you're going to be hiring and firing a lot. And there's going to be a lot of stop and start, momentum breakage, sales up, sales down. There's not going to be really much gradual. Yeah, and here's the thing that, that, that I like to share with our, with, with our clients all the time is if you bring a new salesperson in, it's going to take them six weeks to get the marbles out of their mouth. Or even learn the product and the pitch, right? Right. And then it's going to take them another two months for you to even find out what their baseline is. So if we're looking at a three month to figure out what their baseline is, think about how much investment and money and time there is uh, in that person. That's a good point. So you want to make sure that all these things that are in play are working in tandem together because a, a great salesperson – is literally a money printing machine, which is why the best salesperson in a lot of organizations makes as much as the CEO, because they bring the cash. They, bring they make it the rain, right? They make it rain, Yeah. right? And they know it, right? They know it. You want that. You so want that. going into point number four, rewards and friendly competition. Most great salespeople are competitive by nature. They like that recognition. They like the, the, the banter, all those things. It's, it's why, you know, in, in one of the clients we went to, you know, the whole environment was so low. The energy was so low. They were put right next to the tech team. The tech team was always telling them to talk quieter, 
Like everything was just structured, just wrong. No calls, no morning call. Environment no is key. Environment, environment is key. Environment is key, right? You want to create this like fun, upbeat, competitive environment, right? That in that particular it, 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 you know example, we went in and we installed a bell, like a big old school fire bell, right? And every time somebody made a sale, they had to go and ring that bell, right? And why they ring that bell is because they get to they get to say, hey, look at me. I'm succeeding and then other people get to say, well, if he's succeeding, I can be succeeding, right? And then it like re-jibes everybody back up of like, yeah, we're here to win, you know, and you can put these different stimuli in place, these different rewards, these different competitions because it, it, it adds a layer of like fun again to the grind to keep them focused on the task at hand. And that's the visibility for the, for the salesperson, right? For the salespeople to see where they're at. It's like the leaderboard in golf. Yep. It's such a driver at each hole for golfers. The leaderboard thing has been adopted by sales teams for decades. I remember in it could the, be a big this, whiteboard. That's it what I mean. Be- I was, yeah, I was just going to go to a whiteboard example. In that example of the brokerage environment, they had a huge whiteboard in the front of the room. So all yep. the desks are facing one way, and they're facing out. There's a there's you know they're in rows, kind of like a like a, like an event at a hotel, right? Like four or five desks down in a, in, in a horizontal row. And when a guy opened a new account. The protocol was to go all, he had to walk all the way to the front of the room, put his name on the board and he'd put like, you know, a one next to it. Cause if you opened two, there'd be a two next to it. So at the end of the day, the recognition was always in the afternoon meeting was four. The morning meeting was eight. The four o'clock meeting was a wrap up. The eight o'clock was training would be recognizing all the guys who opened new accounts. Oh, this guy had three new accounts. This guy had one new account. And then it really, to the people that weren't opening accounts, and not getting their name on the board, that was creating guys would stay late. They'd come in early. They wanted to get on the board. Little They'd things like help. that. Little things like that make a big difference. But now here's, here's the question for you, though. How do we do that in a, in a virtual Zoom-like environment where traditionally today, I should say maybe it's 50-50, smaller companies, mid-sized businesses, their salespeople are working from home in different locations, not always on-premises. Thoughts? You know what? I'll tell you one of the simplest ways I see people doing it right now. Obviously, if you've got visibility into your pipe, then you know when people are making sales. Yeah. So you can track that yourself. But I see a lot of clients now, and it's like old school technology, but they'll use Slack. That, no, well, Slack's not old school technology. You could use Slack or an old school technology like Skype, where you put all your salespeople in there in one group, right? And, and instead of ringing the bell, you know, they're, every time they, they make a sale, they're like, boom, killed it. This person signing up for this or this or this. And then motivates like, the ah. others. Wow, that guy just made a 10K sale or something. Motivates the yeah. others, right? And it drives it, right? And then at the end of the day, there's a summary in there from the boss or whatever that's like, congratulations, boom, 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 boom. This person did this, this person this. And then that constant visibility makes them look at the people who are struggling and say, hey, let's have a chat. Yeah. Where, where, where do you think the process might be broken? Where do you think we can improve some stuff here? Boom, 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 right? And the other side of that, Aaron, to answer my own question is, why not Zoom? So in my example of the 90s brokerage environment where we had the morning meeting at 8 and the check-in at 4, why not do that on Zoom? Let's say you 100%. have three salespeople in three different parts of the country and they're all performers. But, you know, listen, we're humans too. And when we're on our own selling by ourselves and going through the numbers and doing Zooms, and if we're not having a great day and the sales aren't clicking, any human being starts to get discouraged. Why Absolutely. not have a Zoom call with your sales you team to. at 4 p.m. every day and have three or four heads on and just go through, hey, what was a win? And what was, for me, what I would normally do is what's a win for you today and what do you feel is a loss, right? So you know, be, be clear about that. What was a win? Hey, I made two sales, huge win, right? Or yeah. I didn't make any sales, but a win for me was I really uncovered this, this rebuttal in the pitch that is overcoming a lot of objection and keeping my lines of communication open with people as an example. So even if you're not making sales, you can still have wins because there can be progress. And if you're not drilling down on that, you will burn out salespeople so fast because they will go through periods of not having sales. And that's the most important time to keep them up. Anybody can keep a sales guy up when he's making a sale a day or two yeah. sales a day. But the real savvy business owner can keep sales, it's just this is leadership, can keep sales guys up even when they're not making sales because they know that they're making progress and ultimately that will turn. It's just, it's the baseball analogy, right? Guy's in a slump, hasn't got a hit in five games, but he's working extra hard with his, with his batting coach and they're uncovering different things in his swing. So he's, he's, he's encouraged by the swing tweaks, discouraged progress. by the slump, but the encouragement of the swing tweak 
puts him over the edge. He takes two steps back ultimately to take three steps forward. You have to engineer that in your business today as the business owner overseeing a salesperson or a sales team. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of, lot of burn and churn in that environment, and it's not a, not a good place to be. I've been in environments where guys are in and out, and I've run environments where guys have gone in and out. I fixed some, wasn't able to fix others. It's just the nature of the game. Yeah, agreed. I shouldn't say well, I, I wasn't able to fix some because that's really not true. I fixed them all. <laughs> I was going to say, did you just say you weren't? Nah, yeah, yeah. Listen, I, I was running that floor in the brokerage firm at the age of 22. I had, like, I had produced, I was the first seven figure producer in my firm at 22. And they said, hey, why don't you, like, why don't you be, like, like why don't you become a junior partner and run the sales floor? I was like, and, and they gave me money to do that in addition to my own production. That was huge for me at 22, 23. But I was running a floor and giving the meeting at four o'clock, Aaron, at the end of the day yeah. to a floor of 80 guys. Yep. And that's, you know, that thrust me into an environment, you know, that, well, and, that and really sped things up for me. You know, the, the, the example that I was talking about, um, you know, where I had to fly out and, and, and fix the team, I, I didn't. Was fix that the California that company? That was that company? No, it was actually a Utah company. It was a software as a service oh, okay. company that I went out to, to meet with. And it was so bad and they were so reluctant to put the things in play that we knew, like I told them what they need to do. And they Isn't that the worst that part to... when they reject the, 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 the protocol? Yeah. And like you and go I'm to like, your this... doctor, they tell you exactly what medicine you need. You're like, nah, I don't want to take it. <laughs> well, I just said to them, this isn't a debate. I'm right. You're wrong. Like that, this is a fact. Did you say it like that or no? A hundred percent. And, and so they, they did like half of the things that I wanted. And a lot of them fell off quickly the moment that I left, which is why you need a good you need, you need constant eyes on it, yeah, right? You you now, in fairness, it. their their sales conversions doubled basically from the day that I left, which made their model work, but their sales conversions probably could have forexed if they had somebody like me in there making sure that these things were implemented every single day. Consistency is the key on that, right? The regular the regular monitoring and auditing of the salespeople is absolutely critical. What's number four? Absolutely. That was we're gonna we're gonna end off today with with point number five, right? And this this should be common sense, but we we repeat we repeat we repeat until it is hardwired into the brain, right? You have to have clearly laid out processes and tools for your team. Do they have a proven script? Do they have a crystal clear understanding of your product and your unique selling proposition? Do they have clear access and understanding of your five top objections that you're going to receive and how to overcome them? Do they have a clear understanding of what are the next steps after they make a sale to onboard XYZ person into XYZ product or process so that they don't lose the sale, right? Do they have access to training and have they been walked through if you were using something like a Pipeline Pro, for example, have they been walked through exactly what they do at each step, every single day, where they move people, how many calls they make, how many emails, whatever. Is it crystal clear the process for the person? Because one of my, five, one of my favorite quotes is the confused mind says no, right? That works on both sides. If you don't have everything dialed in and you're trying to explain it to somebody and they're a prospect and they're confused, they're going to say no. Confused mind says no. And if your salesperson is confused as to what is my protocol, what is my next step, what am I supposed to be doing here, what am I supposed to be saying, the confused mind says no and there's going to be no sales happening. Point number five. Agreed. And if you let salespeople veer off, and get on their own agenda, and I've seen this happen recently, by the way, in a couple examples that come to mind, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a leadership breakdown. Because if sales guy A and sales, guys B, sales guy B are, are, are running off different scripts and they're running their own agenda and they're selling a different way, then you sort of have like a broken model. And, and, yeah. and it has to be like an assembly line in most cases. Now, your, your pros can veer off a little bit, but they get back on track. Right, it's like Jordan. They're Straight working line. within the same framework. They're just maybe putting pieces of their own personality into. Exactly, process. they're injecting some some personality and some life and some humor, whatever, because they're pros and they can do that. But they get right back on track. It's like Jordan's straight line 
persuasion yep. system, right? The best of the best, they, they get taken off track with a rebuttal or somebody sends them down some rabbit hole and, and get, but they're, they're really diligent about getting back on track, getting back into that straight line pitch and going down the avenue, which ultimately leads to a decision. They're really good at doing that. And that's an awareness and an experience thing that comes with time. But it's also a systems thing that comes with the company because if the company's diligent with keeping everybody on a set path as to how they should sell and not letting them veer off and monitoring them and listening to their calls and, and watching their Zoom sessions, there should be a consistency with all of them. The Absolutely. way they present it should all sound pretty similar aside of personality. And if you get on three different sales sessions with three different sales guys in the same company and it sounds like they're all selling three totally different products, that's a problem. And it happens. That's a problem. Or, but it's, or but the that, example but, that... The yep. example that you and I worked through where we thought we the company had a process and then we found out that the person wasn't even doing one-on-one -on -one anymore. They had decided to just that, pile yeah. everybody into a group Zoom call. Like who who that, decided that that was okay? Great example. Yes, that's right. That you know that's instructive. So in this particular company, the model was that people were selling one to one. Yeah. We come to find out later that this guy decides, you know what? I'm going to maximize my calendar a little bit. I think I'm going to send out a Zoom link and put five people on a session and pitch five people at once. We like found out about it after the fact. Can you imagine being the sales guy? But this is a leadership problem, right? Well, there was so nobody monitoring it. That's the thing, right? But could you imagine your sales guy that you think is doing one-on-one -on -one presentations all of a sudden starts putting five on, six on, three on at a time and pitches the group? Because he wants With, to save without time. your knowledge, and because without your six permission. hours just turned into one hour if he put six people on, right? And then he can go play golf the rest of the day or whatever, and say, but but without the knowledge of the company who's paying him. And hey, that could work. Mind -mind. That could be your process. But you, but, need, yeah. But you can't be not knowing that that process. You can't is inject it. Number one <laughs> and number two, you'd need to prove it out with full transparency that it was even happening. I mean, we we don't even have to get into that. But but you're right. That's the little things that can happen. It's a good place to leave off, right? Those are the things that can happen if you want to neglect your salesperson, your sales team, or even your sales process. Hey, listen, you might be the sales team watching right now. You might be the sales guy. And as weird as this will sound, you're going to need to set up accountability measures for yourself. They might not be as militant as if it was a real team. You're not going to maybe, you know, do a Zoom call with yourself and do a sales training with yourself at 4 p.m. on a, But you get the point, right? There needs to be there needs to be standard operating procedures in place, like you just mentioned at the end, kind of SOPs as number five. And for you to hold you accountable, because if you're the one selling, if you're a small to mid-sized business owner, sometimes you're the one selling and you're the one marketing and you're the one in operations. Maybe you have a small team, which is fine. There, there might be enough money in it for that to be the case, but it's easy to get out of selling and sort of let it fall to the side and then not get back on track. And then all of a sudden see sales numbers drop if you're the salesperson. So if you feel like you're going to slip out of that role, you better slip someone into that role right away, even if they're not as good as you just so that they can be having conversations that maybe you don't have the time to have anymore. And that's probably a different conversation for a different show, but that's the, that's the transition from you being the one who makes it rain as the salesperson and the CEO of the company to ultimately giving up that role and getting salespeople and getting sales teams in place. And when you do, obviously you have the five steps here that will make such a big difference. Don't ever hire one salesperson or two salespeople, not even one, without knowing that you have these five little benchmarks in place because they will run out of gas and so will you. And that running out of gas means running out of money. It, it always does. Listen, if sales are down, money's down. I don't know why sometimes that's such a hard thing to wrap your head around, but if sales are down, money's down. And if money's, money's down, you're down. And if you're down, your business is about to go down. So, right? Always yep. focus on the sales. Always focus on the systems. Always focus on the processes that make the sales go. I, t I say this all the time on the show. I love watching Shark Tank. Shark Tank is such an instructive, raw opportunity for business owners to get in, fr get in front of some real deal investors who sold their way to the top, every single one of them, by the way. They sold their way to millions and billions, all of them, which is amazing. And they're always looking to trip you up when you're pitching your business. And they're looking for someone who's as sharp as a tack, who knows every piece of data, every number, every conversion point, cost of goods sold, all of it. And there's just, that's what they want. They're looking for that person who has all the information and has all the data and has all the systems. And that's what you want to be. You want to be that person where if you get on Shark Tank, you pretty much know where everything is at all times. You know what everything is costing you. You're militant about it. And you could easily get money from the sharks. I love it when people don't get any money. It's, 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 math, it's math when they don't get money, Aaron. 
It's math. Yeah. It's, it's they usually because they don't. They, there were certain they things they didn't math. know that they should have known, and they didn't get money. Yeah, and, and if you don't know your math and you don't know your conversions and you don't know your processes, you don't deserve money. You're right. You're right. There's even a metaphysical play there where you'll actually probably be rejecting money, or or you'll 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 somehow be non-magnetized to money because you haven't really demonstrated that you're worth it or that you or that it's it's worth you, right? Yep. So anyways, this was a good one. Really good framework. I'm glad, you know, great job on your end. I know you put this one together. It was, it was phenomenal. And even if you're running winning sales teams, sometimes going back to the fundamentals and just checking in and saying, Hey, do we have these five benchmarks in place? Do we have these steps in place? Because if we don't, we really need to look at this. Maybe we're not checking in enough. Maybe we're not doing enough morning meetings. Maybe we're not doing enough recognition. And, and maybe Easy it's just slip knowledge. Away. Maybe it's just knowledge. You just, you just don't know what you don't know. And all of a sudden you, you come onto a, 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 a a show like this and you go, oh man, like we do all these other things, but we don't do uh, morning kickoff calls and check-in calls. And then you go and you implement them for the next month and you go, oh my goodness, look at the impact that this has had, right? It doesn't make you wrong that you don't have these things in place because you just might not know, but it does make you wrong when you learn and then you don't implement. Yeah. Listen, you're, you're wrong if you know about it and don't do anything about it for sure. For sure. So well, let's leave it there. This was a good one. We will be back as always. Same time, same place, same bat channel next week. 11 a.m. Eastern live on the Facebook page, Sales Velocity TV. If you're watching live, if you're uh, if you're listening on the podcast, or maybe if you're not listening yet, we are on Apple, Google, Stitcher. All of it. Amazon. There's a whole <laughs> bunch of them. I mean, we're all over social. But hey, listen on the go if you can't catch it live. And we will be back same time uh, next week. Another great one here, Aaron. Enjoyed it as always. We'll see you on the next episode. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Sales Velocity TV is powered by Pipeline Pro, the ultimate all-in-one sales pipeline management and marketing automation platform that makes all others obsolete. And we can prove it. Take a tour at gopipelinepro.com. See you on the next episode.